One of my favorite chess players of the 1800s, and honestly, in all of chess history, is Rudolf Karasek. This player was an attacking genius, and he left behind many beautiful combinations and miniatures. But he was also just one of the greatest chess players of his day. He beat the reigning world champion, Emmanuel Lasker, with the King's Gambit. Even in 1890s chess, this was quite a feat, and to my knowledge, this is the only classical victory by anyone over a world champion with the King's Gambit. Sadly, the reason that you may not have heard of Karasek and that his name is relatively underknown in chess is because he died at the very, very young age of 26 of tuberculosis in the year 1900. What would have happened had he been able to continue playing chess? Well, even Lasker, the world champion, said that he should have had to play a world championship match against this man someday had he not been affected so by health. Karasek's opponent in this game, Kanyavitz, opens the game with pawn to f4, the bird opening. Now, I think it makes sense that he would do this at the time because only a few years earlier, the world champion, Emmanuel Lasker, or the soon-to-be world champion, Emmanuel Lasker, won his great double bishop sacrifice game against Bauer with the bird opening. And Kanyavitz definitely seems to be playing for that same starting setup. Now, this game is actually played in the first ever Hungarian Correspondence Chess Championship. And this goes from 1893 to 1897, a four-year tournament as correspondence tournaments may tend to be. I personally actually feel like you see Karasek become a stronger player as this game goes on. In 1893, he was just a young talent, but by the end of this particular event and the way that this game goes, I have to imagine that the game went more than a few years because it's a decidedly hard-fought affair. You actually see a period where by the end of the game, he's one of the strongest chess players in the world. Incredible to see a player develop over the course of a single game. Now, here we see pawn to d5 from Karasek. His initial opening setup is very natural. b3, e6, bishop to b2. The bird really wants control of the dark squares and is willing to give up a few things to achieve that dark square control. Pawn to c5, e3, pawn to a6. A good idea because if you bring the knight to c6, in many cases, the bishop will just come to b5 and exchange itself off for the knight. After all, light squared bishops don't control dark squares, but c6 knights do. On the other hand, uh, in many cases, white is going to want to put the bishop on d3, as happens here, because you want to get that Lasker Bauer double bishop sacrifice. Even if it's probably not going to happen in your game, that's kind of what you're going for if you try for this setup. Knight to f6, castles bishop e7, knight c3, also castles, pawn to a3, keeping a knight out of b4, and b5. Black is just much better here. Even if we love double bishop sacrifices, these bishops aren't actually that well placed, and as long as Karasek plays sensibly, he should have a significant advantage. Rook c1 doesn't really help things. The rook doesn't make sense here. Pawn to a4, trying to break up these strong pawns over here on the queen side and in the center for Karasek makes more sense. Bishop to b7, queen over to e1, queen to h4, uh, in the offing potentially, and just knight back to e8, a good repositioning that takes away the queen's ability to come in in that direction. Uh, e4 now, going for central play, pawn to c4, hitting this bishop right here, and the bishop is going to be pushed back to e2. In this position, Karasek could probably have strongly played pawn to d4, uh, just expanding in the center, but he throws in a check here that the computer considers a little inaccurate. I think the queen's not really better over here on b6, and white's happy to move the king over to h1 and avoid future checks. And now pawn to d4, supernatural, knight back to d1. White's position is in absolute disarray. What should you do when your opponent's position is in disarray like this? Well, when there's not too much going on in terms of tactics, you should really consolidate. And a simple move like queen c5, holding on to the attack c4 pawn and just keeping your beautiful central pawn advantage is much, much better for black. What you shouldn't do is what Karasek actually does, which is demonstrate impatience and try to convert your strong positional advantage into a tactical advantage too quickly. Pawn to d3 here, and Karasek's going to try to create some pass pawns on the queen side, 
He's going to achieve this, but the pawns are actually going to be targets, not going to be able to go anywhere, and suddenly the advantage shifts to white. I like to think, even though I really have no way of knowing uh, this to be true, that this is an example of a younger Karasek demonstrating an impatience that his more mature self would not have gone for. Now, pawn takes d3, pawn takes b3. Here's the pass pawn that we've been hoping to achieve, but this is a very blockaded pass pawn. Rook to c3, knight to a5, defending that pawn, knight to e3, the white pieces, which were so pushed back by the pawns here and here, are springing back to life. A little bit of a combination that makes things more unclear, bishop takes a3, setting up a pawn fork here, always very, very pretty, but white can give back some material here and maintain a great position. Knight up to e5, of course, if this rook is captured, this rook is vulnerable over here. And uh, so the bishop is captured on a3 in this position, knight to c4, knight takes c4, the other knight takes its place. Both of these pawns are loose over here. And now here's a computer line that I really like, super dirty and really, really quite uh, a fine from the engine. The strongest move seems to be queen to b4 right here because after queen b1, going after this pawn right here, and you can't push because then a3 falls. Black has a tactic. It's a very, very sharp move. Bishop takes e4. And I think without this move, the position's much better for white, and this makes things quite complicated. Why bishop takes e4? Why does this work? Well, first off, if rook takes b3, then you have queen takes c4 because of this pin right here. And maybe white's still a little better, but only a little bit, so a very nice move. Um, but also after bishop takes e4, if the bishop is simply captured, there's no bishop here now, so you can play rook over to b8, shore up your b3 pawn, which can no longer be captured, and now you have two huge um, connected pass pawns on the sixth rank. And actually black is much better thanks to these monstrous pawns that can no longer be eliminated. So very nice sequence from the computer with this bishop takes e4. Instead of going in with queen b4, Karasek tries queen to d4, which is a miss just because we've missed this resource here. Rook takes b3, and I think it's clear here that the strategy hasn't worked out for Karasek, but on the other hand, even though he's likely to be down a pawn as this pawn uh, seems soon to fall, let's give him some credit. I think he plays very, uh, very strongly from here. He's going to try and strengthen his bishop, chip away at the center, which does feel like a target. He's going to get this knight all the way over to d4 in time, where it's going to be an absolute monster. The d4 square, whether occupied by the queen or the knight, is just an amazing square. Uh, and honestly, even though the computer likes white, I think on a human level, uh, the way Karasek plays, uh, it feels like black is actually the one pressing, as you see play develop. It's hard to find a plan for white, and black's pieces quickly get to strong squares and create real pressure. So bishop c6 here, knight takes a3, so white is up a pawn, knight to d6, knight to c2, pushing the queen back uh, to a7, knight to e3, pawn to f5, creating pressure here with the miners and the pawn on f5, and also this rook starts to open up, and maybe there's some ideas over here at some point. Rook c3, that's called foreshadowing by the way. Uh, rook a to c8. Basically, every black piece is harmonious now. The computer still says this is a clear advantage for white, plus 1.2. Personally, I'm not feeling like it's so strong. I'm sure if I were playing Stockfish, I'd get crushed and it'd prove that it is plus 1.2. But on a human level, again, it feels like black has a clear plan uh, from here, and it does not feel like white does. On a human level, I think it's um, much more unclear than, than Stockfish thinks. Knight c4. Knight to b5, tickling the rook and heading into d4. Rook c1, pawn to a5, expanding over here. Bishop to d1, knight to d4. What an absolute monster of a piece. Personally, with a knight on d4 that is unchallenged here, it's really hard for me to think that black should objectively be worse at this point. Rook a1, pawn to a4. Uh, and in this position, pawn takes f5 which does open the e-file here. That can be to white's advantage, but it also opens the bishop here, which is certainly to carry sex advantage with the black pieces. Pawn takes f5, bishop takes on a4, picking off a pawn. How much do we care about the pawn? Not that much. 
Rook over to e8, tickling the queen, queen d1. And here, what's the best way to continue for black? Well, the move Karasek plays definitely seems to me to be the most challenging. Bishop takes g2 check. A beautiful bishop sacrifice here. The white king is not safe, and this is entirely sound. After king takes g2, the rook steps up with check. Rook to e2. And here we have a critical decision for white, to block or to step up with the king. Now, actually, the move rook to f2 is the correct move, and it will transpose into the lines we see in the game, which are a draw with best play, as we'll see. So I'm not going to go down this road at the moment. We'll basically see these lines soon. Instead, though, the move king to g3 is played, and this is a mistake because there's now an additional option available to Karasek. He could play the decisive move here, pawn to g5, and this is a significant mistake from him not to see this idea. After pawn to g5, whether or not white or black captures here on g5 f4, where the pawns are attacking each other, the G file will be open. Karasek can swing the queen over to E7 or to G7, and the king is getting basically checkmated here on G3, or white is going to have to surrender a lot of material to evade the checkmates. So G5, decisive move, seemingly missed by both players. Instead, after the king steps up to G3, Karasek plays queen B7, clearly threatening queen G2, which is just checkmate in two. And now, rook to f2. So this is basically transposed to the line we could have seen had the rook blocked on f2 earlier after rook e2 check. In this position, rook to f6, threatening rook g6, leading quickly to checkmate. You cannot capture on e2 because of queen f3 check, and we just checkmate on the next turn on g4. After rook f6, the most natural defense here is knight to e5, played by Konyavitz, and this is stopping rook to g6 check. Now, if here you don't do anything to sacrifice further and continue the attack, white will eventually be able to, you know, capture on e2 or play a move like queen b1, white is still up a piece, so you just have no time here to waste. You must sacrifice on e5, which Karasek does. Surrendering the exchange and having already sacrificed a piece, he's now down a full rook. Pawn takes e5 and rook g6 check. Despite being down a piece and despite the computer evaluating this as 0.00, .00 it certainly still feels very dangerous here for white. As a human, you would be thinking, I'm probably just getting checkmated. I'm probably just getting checkmated. I'm probably just getting checkmated. Well, you're actually not. You're okay, but you must continue to play precisely. Here, both king f4 and king h3 lead again to a draw by perpetual or balanced play. Probably the most natural move, I think, is king to h3, which is not the move played, and Karasek can take a draw here with rook h6, rook g6, easy draw. He could try to press further, for example, with pawn to f4 in this position, and this is opening up ideas like queen c8, trying to bring the queen in over here to checkmate. And in this position, white has to be careful and play a move like queen c1, taking control of the c8 square. And again, you should go for probably a perpetual, although there are still attacking ideas. Like after rook h6, king g4, you can play g5, and it gets crazy complicated, and it's unclear. Um, but should be a draw. Also here... Uh, you could consider um, bishop to b3 check, uh, which is really brilliant. Knight takes b3, rook a8 check, you sacrifice the rook 2, and then queen takes and queen takes b3. And again, the computer just says draw. A move that would lose is pawn to e6 here, which tries to stop the inclusion of the queen like this. Uh, but now after pawn to e6, you have queen d5 and you're coming in. So white again needs to defend very carefully, but white can defend after king h3 if Karasek tries to continue further with pawn to f4 or something like that. The computer says that there are uh, enough resources for white to hold in all lines. Instead, white plays king f4. And in this position, probably the best move, actually definitely the best move, is rook to g4 check. 
And because here white cannot play king e3 because of rook e4 check, uh, sacrificing the rook, and then pawn takes e4, queen takes e4 with a very pretty mate, white must give up the queen. Queen takes g4. But this position is actually quite complicated because white does have two rooks for the black queen uh, and a pawn. I think the material count's not really that relevant, though. The uh, best move here, according to the engine, is king takes g4. And again, it says 0.00. .00. As a human, I would much rather be playing with the queen and knight against the discombobulated white king, two rooks, and bishop, but it is balanced according to the engine. Backing up, after king f4, Karasek actually plays the move queen to d5. And this move allows an insane resource to Konyavitz who could have gained an advantage. That resource is bishop to b3. We've already seen this kind of idea here. Having an extra rook in this position, uh, Konyavitz can give back a bishop to try to break the attack. And in this position, of course, you don't want to take with the queen and exchange queens. And if knight takes b3 here, then there's rook to a8 check. And again, queen takes pulls back, so white has plenty of time to take here and then can actually press the advantage in the endgame. Also, if king up to f7, then you can play rook d8, which at this point is finally forcing the capture of the rook, and then queen takes b3. This is a little better version of the exchange of the rook for the knight, but ultimately it's similar. White has extra pawns, more pieces are coming off the board. White should be better in these positions. So an incredible resource missed by both players, bishop b3 here to include the rook and break the attack. Instead, after queen d5, played is bishop to d7, a mistake uh, which again is trying to get back the bishop but in a different way that allows the queen and knight combination to basically remain unchallenged in continuing the attack. So Karasek picks off the bishop. There's now rook to a8 check, king f7, but in this position there's no further checks like rook to a7 check, there's no queen b3 check, so here, white is still up material and has temporarily pulled back the attack, but not far enough. The king remains too exposed, and Karasek is going to be able to continue the attack after kind of re-coordinating in a moment. Queen to b1, rook to g4 check, king to e3, and a precise move, f4 check. Also good was queen e7 just trying to include the queen over here on g5. After f4 check, we get rook takes f4, rook takes f4, an intermediate check with queen to a2 check, and king to g6. Now in this position, uh, actually Konyavich resigned. And the key question is, of course, what happens if the rook is captured on f4, which is basically the same thing that would have happened had the rook been captured without the inclusion of this check. Well, the answer is after king takes f4, queen f5 check, the queen and knight, a famous attacking combination here, would be able to finish things off and deliver checkmate against the exposed king. The queen and rook for Konyavitz are just too far away from the action. King to e3, queen takes on e5 check, picking off the pawn and defending the knight. King f2, queen check, and if king g1, there's knight f3 checkmate but king g3 doesn't really help because queen f3 check and then knight to f5. A perfect example in the end of the coordination of the queen and knight against the exposed white king. This game is an absolute slugfest. I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope you've enjoyed getting to know Karasek's play as much as I always have. Just a great player, a great attacker, someone who just seems to love the fight of chess. And I really wish that he'd been able to continue playing. And I wish that at some point we could have had a world championship match between him and Emmanuel Asker. But in any case, he did leave us some brilliant games uh, and we can be grateful for that. If you like this game, then of course, be sure to subscribe and also click on the playlist that is popping up on your screen for more of my top 15 games of the before 1900s.